This is a Tibet House member video and is a part of the Force for Good class series, now available at tibethouse.us. Uh, the question was, um, what do you think about the possible correlation between near-death experiences, you know, <laughs> reports of question. near-death experiences, Very clever. And, uh, and the Bardo Thoto, you know, where at least for the beginning of the passageway through the Bardo, they seem to match up, you know, where we have yes, yes. a lot of these cases near of death experience light, is very, Kaya, Reading the near-death experience literature is very useful yeah. for deepening one's concern about what will happen to one after death. You're absolutely right. Although the actual between state, the bardo, is much more drastic than the near-death experience thing, because you actually have died. <laughs> and that means that your subtle con consciousness continuum, according to the way the, the Buddhist, Indian and Tibetan Buddhists describe the mechanism of, the re of rebirth, uh, has actually left this, uh, the physical body. So it can't sort of come back into the physical body. And in the between state, actually, one of the things that it tries to do is it wants to come into the physical body. And then it gets very frustrated when it can't do that. So, um, uh, so, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good comment slash question. Absolutely. And it's very good to build that near-death near experience, memories of previous lives that people have. That literature is very valuable. Jataka tales... Uh, which are not only in the Jatakas, but also in what are called the Avadanas, and even in some sutras, where the Buddha or other enlightened persons talk about what they remember from previous lives, and, what, and they analyze things that happen in this life in terms of the interactions of the same people in previous lives. My favorite of which among them is the one where there was a monk who was annoying everybody um, in the monastery because he would, get, he would sort of get all wound up and, give, and scold people. And, uh, and they, they said, you know, he just brays like an ass, and what can we do? How can we get him to stop? And so then the Buddha said, well, you have to realize that he did this in a previous life, <laughs> and he bothered you guys in the same way. And then he said, there was a thief. In, in another life, there was a thief who used to steal the harvest of some villages. And he had a donkey, and he had a lion's skin that he had gotten in a bazaar somewhere. And he would put the lion skin on the donkey and send the donkey into the fields when the harvest was ready to be harvested by the villagers. And the villagers would think there was a lion in the fields and they would run away. And then he would collect the harvest, load up the donkey, pack up the lion skin and take off and sell it in the market. That was his MO. And then one day he was doing that and then the donkey saw a female donkey in the village and started braying madly, and the villagers who were starting to run away because of the lion, they said, wait a minute, lions roar, they don't bray. <laughs> so they ran back and they ripped the lion skin off the donkey and they saw it was a donkey and then they saw the thief crouching there waiting to grab and steal their harvest and so they beat him to death and, and they made the donkey work in the town as among their, to do work for them. And now, you monks who are one of you monks, the lead monk who was complaining, you are the thief in the previous life. And the guy you're complaining about is the donkey in the previous life. So then Buddha solved their problem. He got them to be less self-righteous about the guy who was braying. And he got the guy to not bray <laughs> at the other monks. So Buddha had a pretty good sense of humor, I think, really. He did find that previous life, one of my favorite stories. So anyway, I'm just saying that it's really important. So the first thing to meditate on is leisure and opportunity. And this is very important for compassion, for the bodhisattva mind, and for the intensity. So of course it's important for renunciation, and it's important for the intensity to really gain wisdom, insight. So it's foundational to the whole path. This, your own, you know, your own, your own estimation of your own value. You have to realize, if you have adopted the consensual theory in this backward and slightly psychotic culture that we live in, and we have been educated in, and we have been raised in, if you are stuck still in that, then you do not consider yourself to be anything of value. 
And actually, if you think your consciousness will cease when your brain stops, what you mean, what you're really saying to yourself is that your consciousness is not here now. There's an illusion that the brain creates that you have, you're here, but your consciousness is already nothing. So you just don't exist, actually. When you get depressed, therefore, you're ready to shoot yourself right away because you can return to your actual state, which is a state of nothingness. So if you go around subconsciously and subliminally thinking that you're nothingness, you're not going to have a happy life at all. And you have to go in and find that in your mind. That is why we're brainwashed like that. We are, we are from a backward Western, Asia, Western Eurasian culture, we Western people, from a backward Western Eurasian, and even now if you're an Eastern person, but brought up in the Western sort of supposed great, brilliant educational system, materialist-dominated system, and, uh, and you are basically conditioned to be a slave consumer and a slave producer in an industrial society like Charlie Chaplin, you know, who's a cog in a wheel, and, that's, and, you don't, and you're, you're meant to tolerate that situation because you're not very valuable. You're just a piece of, you're a bag of chemicals in a cheap chemicals in a bag of water running around thinking you exist when you don't really and trying to like do something to make yourself think you exist because you inside think you don't really exist. And it's all really nothing, actually. Which is totally, totally predicated. It's just, it's no better than the Inquisition that the scientists thought they had so brilliantly escaped from, they told you you're kind of worthless sinner, and you're only useful if you believe in them, and then they'll open the door for you to go and sing in God's choir, and you'll never be God yourself. And any mystic who thinks they are one with God, then they're more or less going to burn them at the stake as being mislaid. Even poor Teresa of Avila, who had visions of union with Jesus, had to flagellate herself all the time between visions. And down the street from where she was telling her father confessor that she'd had this oneness with Jesus feeling, were people being burned at the stake in the auto da fe of the, Chinese, of the Spanish Inquisition. And so they think they're greatly liberated, these scientific-minded materialists, but they're actually just as self-deprecatory as the old people under the church, that you're a worthless sinner, actually. But you're just plain worthless. You're not a sinner. <laughs> because it doesn't matter whether you sin, because you're nothing. I'm sorry, but that is, I'm sorry to condemn it, but it is the case. That is the bottom line in our culture. I'm, I'm very much sorry. That is why. And do you wonder why we happen to be destroying our planet? Destroying all the other animals on it? And we have machinery that could destroy in a war in a short period of time, which we hand over to some psychological defectives? through elections, or become, they become dictators through politics, another kind of politics. Is that intelligent? Do you think we're an intelligent culture? Everyone is all freaked out.